So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, afternoon class. Okay. Uh, let's continue from the lesson from last week. Okay. We are in the series of Dhamma lesson, okay, following the core teaching of the Buddha, and that is the series of the Four Noble Truths. And we have covered, uh, we have been talking uh, under the Dhamma topic of the Four Noble Truths, and we talk about the first Noble Truth already, the Dukkha, the concept of Dukkha. And we also discuss on the second Noble Truth, which is Samuttaya, or the cause of suffering, which is the technical term called Tanha. And today, we are moving to number three, which is Nirota, or the cessation, or the ending of suffering. And next week, hopefully we can finish okay, the last four noble truth, which is the Makkha, or the Eightfold Path. You know, and then we continue to the next topic. And today, we are approaching one of the most difficult topics in the teaching of the Buddha which is Nirotha. Nirotha is synonymous for Nibbana. It's another name for Nibbana. And that is Nirotha, the ending of suffering. Okay? This is quite challenging for us to talk about something that none of us in this room have experienced before. We cannot experience Nibbana through human sense, eyes, ears, nose, touch, you know. It just cannot. It's beyond day-to-day -day experience. It's beyond ordinary, you know, human experience. Okay? Even though it's difficult, it doesn't mean that we should avoid talking about it. <laughs> okay? We must at least, you know, open ourselves to the idea of Nibbana. What exactly that the Buddha wants us to know? Because this Four Noble Truths is considered the heart and soul of the teaching of the Buddha. So we need to understand four of these you know, thoroughly, to the best of our ability to be able to understand. So, if you know nothing about Buddhism, let's say today you just start learning. This is a summary of the teaching, the core teaching in Buddhism. The Buddha discovered something through his enlightenment. He, he discovered the nature of life, the true nature of life. And that true nature of life, he discovered something called the Dukkha. The Dukkha or suffering. He come down to the conclusion that Clinging on the five aggregate is the cause of suffering, is the dukkha. Okay, there is two keywords here. Clinging on what? On the five aggregate. And then it causes us dukkha. Okay, we have covered that uh, last week and when we talk about the five aggregate. So go back to study on that. And not only that, he explained that dukkha, not just an ordinary suffering or pain in human life. Dukkha has its cause, and the cause of Dukkha is called craving or Tanha. Okay? So, clinging on five aggregate is suffering. And why we cling on five aggregate? Because there is something called Tanha that force us, that trap us to cling on the five aggregate. Okay? This is very deep. We cannot see Tanha. Tanha is some sort of defilement, mental impurity that stay in human mind. To see tanha, you need to see your mind. You need to know how the mind works. See? It's, we cannot just intellectually understand it. You have to actually see it. And then, we know the cause. So in order for us to free ourselves from dukkha or suffering, you need to get rid of the cause of suffering. You need to uproot the tanha. And that's, that's the idea. How can we be free from suffering? We need to take care of the tanha to completely remove it. And then dukkha will be disappear. Dukkha will be gone. And in order to do that, the Buddha mentioned that there is a way to do that. And that is called the Eightfold Path. You need to follow the Eightfold Path. And then you know, it helps you to free yourself from, uh, from suffering. It helps you to remove these three tanha. Okay, craving to have, craving to be, and craving not to be. Okay, once you remove the cravings or the tanha, that stage is called nibbana. The extinction of tanha is called nibbana. 
So Nibbana first appear here in the first teaching of the Buddha in the Majjhaka Pawatana Sutra. As you can see, this is very deep. For someone to fully understand the Four Noble Truth is extremely deep. And that is why the meaning behind Samma Titi imply that you must have full understanding of the Four Noble Truth. Otherwise, it's called Micha Titi. You not understand the real meaning of life. And I'm not surprised that you know, when I first encountered the first teaching of the Buddha, the Buddha did mention that after his enlightenment, he take seven weeks to try to understand what he has achieved. It took him seven weeks to uh, reflect upon it, to think over it, to make sure that it's, it's right. And at the end of that seven weeks, he realized that what I discovered was very profound. No one in this world have this experience before. So maybe I should not teach the world because not many people will, will not understand what I am talking about. It's so profound. That's why he was reluctant to teach. Okay? Until all the, one of the Brahma came down and, and, and begged him to teach. And that is why he said, okay, there may be someone who smart enough to understand my teaching. So maybe I should teach those people. And that is why his teaching journey starts and he located the five aesthetic and then he gave the first teaching to these five aesthetic and this is exactly what he teach them the four noble truth the thing is five aesthetic happen to be a very smart group of monks they have been meditating for a very long long time so when you study Dhammachak you may be notice that not many explanation a very Dhammachak is very short maybe one or two paragraph but this two paragraphs allow one monk to achieve the first level of enlightenment. Soda Patana, Anya Kotanya, he achieved the first level of enlightenment without detailed explanation about the Four Noble Truths. And then the Buddha moved on to the second teaching called Anattalakana Sutra, which is talking about permanent, impermanent. At the end of this second teaching, all of them, five of them, achieved Alahan, the highest realization of the truth of Nibbana. You see, these people are very smart. And when it's time for us to talk about something very deep like Nibbana, like five aggregate, okay, we need to be very careful, try to put the right approach to the study. Otherwise, it creates confusing. The more we talk about Nibbana, the more it confuses us. Because no one has that, that experience before. And there is no word in the world put together that can explain, fully explain experience of Nibbana. It's impossible. You may spend yourself, read a lot of books, try to understand what it is intellectually, you still not understand it. To me, the best place for us to start learning the teaching of the Buddha is, you know, get back to the original source, which is the, the Buddhist text. Okay? This is the Buddhist text in English. We have English, Chinese, Thai, don't just believe what people said on the internet or book that you read. Get back to the primary thought. I want to know what exactly that the Buddha talked about Nibbana. So I start from here first. So today I'm going to share with you what exactly that mentioned in the text. That's why today many texts will be appear. So I decided to use the screen. And uh, this is a, a three book that I want to recommend. So give yourself time to study. Okay. Uh, this is the book that talk in detail about the Four Noble Truths, each one of them in English, okay, writing by one of the well-known Thai Buddhist scholar, this one. And this one is another good book. It talks about many concepts of the teaching of the Buddha, the karma, the rebirth, the independent origination, including Nibbana. This is also another good book. We have this in our library, okay? uh, the, te the Buddha and his teaching. And again, this is another one that strongly recommended. This is the Visuddhimaka, the path of purification in English. We have both English, Chinese, and Thai. This is the English one. I just placed an order. Uh, it's a good reference book composed by Buddha Khosa, the, the, the Buddhist scholar monks back then. Uh, help yourself. We have this book in the library. The teaching of the Buddha has different level. It's deep. He mentioned that his teaching is like driving into the, the ocean. The ocean goes slope like this, right? It goes deeper and deeper. It depends how far you want to go, 
how deep you want to know about my teaching, about his teaching. The first level may be just like the day-to-day -day benefit. Okay? You learn about five precepts, you learn about how to love your parents, how to take care of your um, mom, your dad, your wife, your employees, and that gives you a peace of mind in day-to-day -day basis. You can take approach to Buddhism just like that and feel good about it. It's okay, no problem. As long as it works for you, as long as you feel comfortable too. Okay? And the second level is, you know, you can go deeper than that. Okay? The Buddha talk about karma, the law of karma. The Buddha teach about life after death. This is not the first lifetime that we born, and it's definitely not the last lifetime either. There is the life after death. So if you want to know, you know, and want to prepare yourself for the future lifetime, for the future rebirth, and there are teachings that help you to design your own life for the better future, I mean, the life after death. You can go to that level. But for those of you, especially monks, the reason we ordain simply because we want to free ourselves from the root cause of suffering, which is the defilement and the tanha, right? That's the primary reason why people become a monk. So the ultimate goal of us being a monk is to achieve Nibbana. This one, to achieve Nibbana. As a monk, this is our goal. As the lay people, well, Nibbana is not their urgent agenda. <laughs> I know Nibbana is good, that's what the Buddha said. Okay? But I'm not in a hurry, so let me you know, keep on my pace, enjoy my life, having kids, family, business. But I can observe five precepts. I can do the dana, right? Giving five precepts, meditation, you know, here and there. But for monks, no, we don't want to waste time on doing this. You get on the highway and you rush yourself to Nibbana. And that's the ultimate goal of Buddhism, Nibbana. So that is why it's unavoidable for us to encounter the concept of Nibbana because it's the goal of us being a monk to achieve Nibbana one day. Even though it may be difficult, but again, you know, at least it has to start somewhere. So instead of me trying to, trying to explain to you what Nibbana is, which is, I don't think I'm qualified for that because I don't have experience you know, just like you guys as well. So, what the best I can do is to show you exactly what appears in the Buddhist text, what the Buddha talked about Nibbana, what he said, what he means, and then we may help each other to come up with some you know, conclusion, some understanding, okay, based on the best of our ability, okay? And that's, I think, the approach that I would like to share with you today. And this is what he said about the third noble truth. In the fourth noble truth, Nirotha, which is the truth of cessation. This is exactly mentioned in the text. He said, monks, it is the discharge, putting out, giving up, abandonment of desire, the freedom from desire, the absence of any lingering desire. This is what? This is Nibbana. There occurred to me, monks, the eyes, the insight, the wisdom, the knowledge, the light, making me realize that this is the noble truth of cessation. This is to be realized. This I have completely realized. That's what he explained to the five aesthetic. We're talking specifically on the third noble truth, okay, only today. He realized that there is a cause of suffering. That cause of suffering, this textbook used the word desire, okay. There are many words that people use to explain the tanha. The Pali use the word tanha. The English sometimes use desire, sometimes use craving. It depends on the translator. So when you read the textbook, you need to be kind of keep in mind that, okay, what it means by this English vocabulary. Because the teaching of the Buddha is kept in Pali and it's translated from Pali to other languages. So when you read text from your own language, you read in English or Chinese, you need to think of the Pali as well, what this term refer to, okay? Because one, maybe five English vocabulary, not enough to explain one Pali word. <laughs> so you need to kind of have that, you know, picture in mind. So in this case, the Buddha talk about the tanha, 
which is desire. One should discharge. This is the same. It's the same meaning. Discharge, putting out, giving up, abandonment. You remove. Remove what? You remove desire. You must remove desire. And once you remove desire, you will realize something called Ibana. And I myself, because of my eye, this is not a human eye, it's the divine eye. Remember, he achieved enlightenment through his meditation, not just by reading book or contemplating or thinking, try to figure out how to fix the, the, the suffering. No, it happened through his enlightenment, through the divine eye. Once he has gone to this process, divine eye, you know, jhana, supra knowledge, and then it occurred to him that this is the way to end suffering by getting, getting rid of the desire of tanha, which is kama tanha, pawa tanha, and vipawa tanha. And his job is to realize, and he have realized that. So he know, he found it, and he realized that this is exists. And now he has completely realized it. So all the desire has completely gone from his mind. And this is the same approach he wants the five aesthetics to follow. You need to realize that, hey, suffering exists, cause of suffering exists, and nirotha or nirvana actually exists, you have to realize it. Your goal is to realize nirvana by yourself. And he used him himself as an example. The five ascetics, they understand. <laughs> they kind of understand. So they follow the Buddha teaching and eventually, okay, all of them have achieved nirvana while they're still alive. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's take a look at the meaning of nirvana. Okay, meaning of Nibbana. Nibbana, sometimes you hear the word Nirvana. Nirvana is Sanskrit word, but Nibbana is a Pali. So I stick with the Pali, Nibbana. Nibbana come from Nirvana. Okay, Ni means what? Ni means depart. Okay, going out, extinguish. That means ni, remove. Okay, Vana refer to craving. Okay of fire. Remove what? Remove fire in your mind. Remove craving. So when the Buddha teach the third sutra, the third discourse, he will explain what the three fire means. Okay? In short, the fire refer to lopa, dosa, and moha. Lopa is greed. Okay? Dosa is ill will or hatred, and moha is ignorant. So the Buddha compared these three set of defilement as the fire. The world is being burned. We are on fire by these three set of defilements. It keeps burning us moment to moment. Every breath that we take, we are being burned by these three fire, three set of fire. So Nibbana uh, literally means, you know, you, you, you extinguish, completely extinguish the, this set of fire that burning your mind, that burning yourself, that keeping you in the cycle of suffering. So you need to find a way to, to remove them. Okay? What happens if you remove the fire? The fire is hot, right? Once you remove it, it's cool down. The temperature drop, you feel cool, you feel peace, you feel happy. That's the idea of Nibbana, that's the word. Okay? And that is why when you read the Dhamma book from many scholars, people may refer Nibbana to something that, you know, cool, peace. So when your mind is at peace, that means you achieve Nibbana. When you're feeling cool, feeling happy, that means you are in the Nibbana stage. That's Many people translate like that, which is okay, you know, according to the meaning. Okay? But in fact, if Nibbana is only that simple, that's too simple. Okay? You don't need enlightenment to understand that. Okay? But I think it's a good way for us to, to communicate uh, the feeling or the sense of Nibbana when your mind is at peace. Okay? Because Nibbana is the supreme peace. There's no more suffering. But the thing is that we don't have that experience. Even though we have that experience, the Buddha himself still have a hard time explaining what it is. 
This is some of the vocabulary that trying to explain one word. Nibbana. There's more than this. Okay, from the Buddhist text. This is the one that you may see often. Non-condition. Supramundane. Okay, immortality. Emancipation. Highest refuge. Okay, freedom. There are many words. Point to the same thing. Nibbana. So before we move further, I'd like to mention it here out front because we will encounter something that related to this later on. Okay. In Buddhism, in the eyes of Buddhism, everything in the mundane world and supramundane world, everything that exists in this planet Earth, universe, or even you know, the place that we have no idea, like Nibbana, everything falls into two dimensions, two categories. Okay. The first one, is called Sankhata Thatu. Thatu means element. If you learn chemistry, you may be familiar with elements like H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, two hydrogen and one oxygen, we get water. This is called Sankhata Thatu. It's a Pali word. Thatu means thought or element. And why is it called Sankhata? Because it has condition. It cannot just exist by itself. The water cannot exist by itself. The water exists because of the condition of two hydrogen and one oxygen, and that's become water. Everything that cannot exist by itself is called sankhata. Okay? It's conditioned, it's compound, it's construct, it's composed, it's produced. Everything fall into this category is called sankhata. Including us as a human being, as a five aggregate, can you born by yourself from the air, from the earth? We can. We born from our parents, the condition, human and soul together and become, you know, us. This table cannot exist by itself. Someone need to grow the wood. Someone needs to cut down the wood and take the wood to the factory and go through the process, you know, and it becomes the table. You put the color on it. You have to decide until it becomes this table. It's condition. It happened with condition. It cannot happen by itself. And that is why it's called Sankhata. Can you name one thing that doesn't fall into this category? One object in this world? Or one thing that you know that it, it exists Longpi, without condition? Cars, house, computer, you name it? Probably not. The moon, the sun, the universe, is it, is it exist by itself or it has to exist with condition? If you learn the theory of Big Bang, right? There's the Big Bang is a bomb that you know, makes the universe. That, a lot of things that scientific try to prove. But in general, there are two things in the eyes of Buddhism. Things that happen by itself and things that happen by condition. The only thing that mentioned that happened by itself is this one, Nibbana. Nibbana is called Asankhata Thatu. Asankhata Thatu or Asankhata element. There is no condition, no compound, and construct, and compose, and produce. <laughs> so keep this information in mind. Okay? Now we are talking about something that, wow, I can't even name one thing. It not exist in this very world in this planet Earth, that we can name one thing that happened by itself without condition. But there is one thing, when you learn the Dhamma, you will hear a lot. People will talk about Asankhata. Asankhata means Nibbana. Okay? Nibbana, I don't know what to call it. Is it a place? Is it a, a state? Is it a, a experience? We need to come up with some word that we kind of have the same understanding. Okay? It's something that exists without condition. Nibbana is not happen as a, as a result. Before I give you an example of what mentioned in the text, uh, this is the story that actually mentioned as well. When we talk or trying to understand Nibbana, why it's so difficult? Okay. The Buddha gave example of 
the turtle and the fish. So these two creatures, they live together in the ocean. But the turtle has ability to live in both worlds, the dry land and under the water. But the fish, throughout his whole life, fish stay in the water. Fish never live on the dry land. So one day, you know, they met, oh, fish said, oh, turtle, where have you been? I haven't seen you for a, a long time. He said, oh, I went up to the dry land. <laughs> fish said, what is the dry land? You know, can you tell me about it? You know, and, and then the turtle, you know, kind of, he tried to think of what to say, what, how to explain the dry land to the fish who never been up there. He said, uh, fish, asked, fish asked the turtle, is it, is it cool? Is it dry? I mean, is it uh, refreshing? Is it clear? Is it has wave or ripple? You know, can I see through it? Can I swim on it? And all the questions that the fish asked the turtle, the answer is no. <laughs> Whatever you ask, no, 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 no. And at the end, fish said, you know, there is no such thing called the dry land. I don't believe you. The turtle has, you know, he said, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say no more because that's all I can say. You know, I have so limit, uh, the limitation of vocabulary. Try to ex explain my experience of the dry land to you who never experienced that. This has happened to Buddha, to all the Arahant. They are acquainted to both mundane world and supramundane world. Just like the turtle acquainted to water and dry land. So he know both places. He experienced that himself. But us as a human being, we only acquainted to this mundane world, this world. We have no clue what it is, Nibbana. And that is why I kind of understand when I got to this metaphor that why the Buddha don't want to teach at the beginning. He will run into the same trouble with the turtle. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know how to explain, you know, uh, five aggregate, Nibbana, dependent origination, you know, cause and effect. It's so deep, so profound. But I have been there. I have realized it. I have experienced it, just like the turtle. I have been there. I just came down and I shared with you what the dry land looked like, but you don't believe me. This is what happened to me when I was studying in, uh, in the U.S. You know, with my friend and, uh, 25 years ago, a very long, long time ago. Back then, there was no internet yet. Imagine how long. <laughs> no internet. And a friend of mine, I don't know where he heard the word durian you know, from somewhere, and then he asked me, do I know durians? Could I explain what durian looked like to him? So I did my best. I believe I know how to explain. So I tried to explain to him, it's like, it's the fruit with the, the football size, it has the uh, spike, and the meat is yellow, and it's sweet, it tastes good. And at the end of that conversation, he said, oh, are you talking about jackfruit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I was trying to explain durian to him, and his understanding is jackfruit. Because jackfruit and durian look the same, but totally different thing. See how difficult it is? Jackfruit and durian exist on this planet Earth. We, we all know. But when it's time to explain, so difficult. So the best thing for me to do is to go buy durian and have him eat it. Have him try it himself and then no more question. Once he eat it, don't need to ask how durian tastes look like. When we talk about Nibbana, can you imagine how difficult it is for the Buddha to explain what Nibbana is? So he said, Nibbana is so called because abandonment of desire. This is the first characteristic of Nibbana mentioned in the early Buddhist text. What is Nibbana? Oh, Nibbana is when you have completely removed desire. So is that mean the experience or is that mean the place that you can actually enter to? There's no explanation. And Saliputta, Saliputta, another, you know, his great disciple explained, you know, elaborate a little bit more what it means by Nibbana. He said, what is Nibbana? The destruction of what? Lust, hatred, and delusion. Once these three things completely gone, is called Nibbana. This is explained by Saliputta. 
What interesting to me is in the early Buddhist text, these two teaching, the most reference when people talk about Nibbana. When I say early Buddhism, I mean the four Nikaya. You guys have an idea? In the, in the Sut, Sutra Pitaka, there are five Nikaya, five collection. So from one, two, three, four, five, and each collection is called Nikaya. Okay. Collection one, collection two, collection three, collection four, and collection five. So the first four Nikaya, or the first four collection, is the teaching of the Buddha that has been confirmed by the first meeting of the monks after the Buddha passed away, that this is exactly what the Buddha talked about. So it kept in the first four collection, first four Nikaya, and this is the early Buddhism. So the teaching that we are talking is here somewhere in the first four. But the rest of the explanation of Nibbana appears here in the fifth, which is the later Buddhism, not the early Buddhism. But the question is, does Nibbana really exist? Or it's just the terms called that experience when the tanha, when tanha has been removed? You need to differentiate between when you realize something and the thing that you realize. Let's say you read the book, you have knowledge. Knowledge is one thing, but for you to get that knowledge, you have, that's a different thing. You have to think, you have to read. So when you realize this thing, this thing is another thing, but realization is another thing. It's not the same thing. So does Nibbana exist as this thing, or Nibbana is just the terms called removal process of Tanha, or craving? <laughs> so keep this picture in mind, okay? So I'm trying to say here is there are three kinds of tanha, okay? Crave to be, crave to have, and crave not to be. Okay. There are three kinds of tanha. And we know that tanha is the root cause of suffering. When we remove this, we realize Nibbana. That's what it means. When you read the text, you need to kind of think deeper. Is that, is that the process or is that the Nibbana itself? When we remove this, and then it's called Nibbana. That's what the text says. So keep this in mind and to see if we can find the answer together. This is a second characteristic that found in the later Buddhist text, not the early Buddhist text. And here it said, there is that sphere. Okay? Sometimes you hear the word Dhamma here. People use different vocabulary when they translate Pali to English. The Dhamma, the sphere, or the nature, which refer to the same thing, Nibbana. Okay? There is that thing, sphere, okay? where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no air, no sphere of infinite space, no sphere of infinite consciousness, no sphere of nothingness, no sphere of neither perception nor perception, nor non-perception, not this world, not the world beyond, neither moon nor sun. <laughs> Monks, I say there is surely without any coming going, persisting, passing away, rebirth. It is quite without support, unmoving, without an object. Just this is the end of suffering. This is the key word here. This is point to Nibbana. You see how difficult it is for the Buddha himself try to explain Nibbana. He said there is no earth, no wind, no fire, no going, no coming, no rebirth. No feeling, no happiness, no suffering, no nothing. And what it is? <laughs> uh, that, is that is what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, we still have no idea what he's talking about. And that's the best vocabulary he can find. Try to put in words. Explain his direct experience with Nibbana. It's very difficult. In this case, the Buddha points to something that is not just, it's not just the extinguish of Tanha, 
the nibbana is something that you know exists. It exists. It's, there's no 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 object there. No water. No fire. No heat. No feeling. This is very confusing stuff. It's deep stuff. So so my suggestion is we stick with the text. Okay, we stick with the primary text. Even though the primary text has different version, different translator. So when I read, I don't read just one text. Even the same teaching, at least three or four, whatever I can find to compare. What kind of vocabulary vocabulary they use? What 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 is the idea behind that translation? Uh, at least it gives us a different perspective, and then we try to understand, you know, from there. And this is the second one. Actually, the third one that the Buddha mentioned. He said, "Is an unborn, unoriginated, unmade, non-conditioned state. If there were not these unborn, unoriginated, unmade, and non-conditioned, and escaped from the born, originated, made condition, would not be possible. As there is an unborn, unoriginated, unmade." And non condition and escape from born originated made condition is possible. Okay. Do we understand this? That is why I mentioned a sankata and sankata at the beginning, right? Sankata means condition. Okay, table, us, things, condition. A sankata means non condition. This is a sankata. The Buddha tried to explain a sankata. It is unborn, unmade, unconditioned. Okay. And if being born as a human being with these five aggregates cause us suffering. It cause us suffering. And if there is no such a place where there is no more suffering, how can we escape from this suffering experience as a human being? Okay, if you imagine that the Buddha is was born prince, he born. As a prince, he lived luxurious life. His life was perfect, but he was not happy. He was bothering with this kind of thought that, how come people still getting old? People get sick and people die, and my mom die, you know, people die. He was not happy, and he he tried to figure out is that any way to fix this problem. He didn't know what it was. When he left the palace, he said, "I went out to search for something called kusala or kusun," but. Kusun means just the good thing, you know. He hoped that there may be a cure or medicine that heal this suffering, this born uh, birth, sickness, and death. That's what his original intention. And finally, he found it. He found something called nibbana, and this is the characteristic of nibbana: that there is there is no condition, there is no rebirth, there is unborn, there is unmade, there is unoriginated. If there is no such a place, escape from suffering is impossible. That's what this paragraph, you know, trying to explain. You guys follow so far? Okay. So you want to escape from suffering. This is you. Okay. Life is so suffering. We are trapped in somewhere in the samsara in this world. With the circle of birth, sickness, and death, over and over and over, without there's no way to escape this cycle, and that's what the Buddha or Prince Siddhartha was not very happy about it. He tried to figure out: Is there any way that I can break free from this cycle, that the round of rebirth? And he found this one. He found such a place that hey, we human being, we can escape from this cycle of rebirth if we arrive here. And he called this place nibbana. That's what it means. That if there is no nibbana, existing or escaping from the cycle of rebirth of samsara is impossible. Once it's impossible, we don't have to do anything. Because there's no way we can escape this. We die. We go to heaven. We go to hell. Whatever it is, there's no way for us to escape this cycle. 
But the Buddha and all the Arahant, they have realized this, they have attained this, and then they confirm with us, hey guy, there is such a place, just like the turtle discovered the dry land. There is such a place for us to break free of the cycle of samsara. So can you answer that question, this one? Does Nibbana exist? Or it's just the name of calling this experience that get rid of this and then Nibbana. Okay. Abhidhamma endorsed that Nibbana is the existing reality. It exists. Okay. But just again, what we learned today is very deep. Don't just oh believe or not believe. Take it. Think about it. Okay. This is I think it's the beauty of religious study. Religious has to have something deep, right? It's not just five precepts or, or take care of family member. No, it's beyond that. Okay? You have, this is the ultimate aims in Buddhism, the ultimate aims of the Buddha teaching to get to this place one day in the future lifetime. The thing is, we have no idea what it is. That is why, especially as a monk, it's your job, okay? to realize this. At least read first, study first, okay, and then meditate. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the type of Nibbana. I need to talk about this because it's mentioned in the text and it's very confusing. When we talk about type of Nibbana, does Nibbana have one place or three places or five places? How many types of Nibbana are out there? Okay, the text says there are two elements of Nibbana. Okay, see, this one they use the word element. You may be encountering different vocabulary. Keep in mind what it means. What two? The element of Nibbana with the upati. Upati means residue. Still remaining and that without upati or without residue. <laughs> but to make it easier, okay, upati means the five aggregate mean us, human, body. And Nibbana with, with, with five aggregate exists is called Sa Upati Tesa, Nibbana, this one. And when the body dies, you enter Nibbana, you realize Nibbana. This is the second kind of Nibbana, it's called Anupati Tesa Nibbana. Just, just want to bring up this vocabulary so when you do self-study you don't you have an idea that you have gone through this before okay so to keep it simple saupati sesa nipana you think of the buddha the buddha himself enlightenment at the age of 35 right he was young he was still alive and then he realized nibbana this is what it is saupati sesa nipan so you you realize nipan when you're still alive your body still exists but at the age of 80, when he died, that he realized Nibbana without this body exists. So the body died, and then, you know, he entered, he realized Nibbana. Many times, I, I don't like the word enter. Enter imply that, let's say, you enter the room. Sometimes it's very confusing. It's misleading. Because Nibbana is not the room that you can just walk into and then you sit there. So many times people use this word and it creates confusing idea of Nibbana. Nibbana cannot enter. To me, I feel like we, we, we just cannot enter to that experience. We need to realize it. We need to attain it. I don't know what vocabulary is, is, is the best, okay? But definitely, definitely not this one. So when you hear I say the word enter, Sometimes I, I don't mean that, <laughs> to, to, to enter into the room, to enter into the condition, okay? So it's realizing Nibbana. So you're going to see uh, this vocabulary when you read the Buddhist text, Saupati Sesa Nipan and Anupati Sesa Nipan, okay? So don't get confused. And the question is, where is Nibbana? If it exists, Lumpi, you just said it exists. No, I. It's not my word, it's from the text. <laughs> the, the Abhidhamma said it is an existing reality, okay? It's not just the experience. But the question is, where is it exactly? 
This is the question that being asked, you know, it's a common question. This one, uh, King Milinta asked uh, Venerable Nakasen, if Nibbana exists, where is Nibbana? This is how he answered. He said, uh, please think of the fire, okay? Can you tell me where the fire is kept? Where is the fire? It's impossible for you to pinpoint or locate the fire. But when you put two pieces of wood together, you start rubbing, and then you get the heat, and then you get the fire. But once you remove these two pieces of wood, the fire is gone. So fire, we don't know where it keeps, where it stays, but it will exist when the condition is right. When the temperature is right, when you do it long enough, and then you get fire. So that's the idea. He said, the fire is not stored up in any particular place, but it arises when necessary condition exists. Same thing with Nibbana, okay? Not to exist in any particular place, but it is attained when necessary conditions are fulfilled. Okay? One condition for sure is the condition of getting rid of these three things. Once this thing getting rid of, and then we can realize Nibbana, this condition. But the question is, where is this one? We don't know. Same thing, if I ask you, where is your mind? You know you have body, you're alive. You know you have mind, but can you pinpoint where is your mind? Here, here. Where exactly is your mind? We, we can't answer that. So Nibbana, same thing. It exists somewhere, but don't know where. That's Nakasen, Venerable Nakasen, explained to King Milinta. Okay? And the Buddha also mentioned okay, in Tamachak that if you want to realize Nibbana, you need to follow something called the Noble Eightfold Path. It's the only path that leads you to Nibbana. See, when you study the teaching of the Buddha, I always emphasize that please try to connect what we learn. We learn the Four Noble Truths, we learn the Dukkha, we learn the dan Tanha, the craving, and now we get to know the Nibbana, and we will, you know, learn about the Eightfold Path and how all of these four elements connected to each other. How the Eightfold Path get rid of this thing and take us to this place. Just, you know, keep asking yourself. Once you keep on asking yourself, you know, it will, you will have a deep reflection on the teaching of the Buddha. It, things start to make more sense to you. Okay, so don't just learn the Dhamma uh, and don't know how to connect the dot. Okay, okay I understand the first number truth, I understand the Tanha or the craving. Now I kind of understand the Nibbana in a certain level. But how can you put things together to work into practice? That's one of the most important questions. The question that one monk, one Brahmin asked the Buddha, okay, you teach about Nibbana, you teach about the Eightfold Path, and, and, and how come uh, some of your students achieve Nibbana, and how come many of them don't achieve Nibbana? What's wrong with them? And that's the question. So can, if I follow your teaching, can I will surely realize Nibbana? This is what the Buddha answered. Okay? So af why showing, why, why, uh, why after showing people the path, which is the, the path to Nibbana, some managed to attain Nibbana, but others did not. And why is that? The Buddha said, Nibbana exists, and the path that leads to Nibbana exists, and I am present as the guide, Yet when my disciples have been advised and instructed by me, some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal of life, and some do not attain. What can I do about it? I am only the person who showed the way. <laughs> what can I do about it? <laughs> this is quite interesting. No, first, first, very first time that I I start, you know, learning about Nibbana, I have a picture of like this in myself. I think of the Buddha as, uh, the Buddha is like human being like us, he born in the same world, right? But he feel like he, 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 something's bothering him, and he was not happy. As a prince, he should be happy, right? But he was not happy. Uh, the Dhamma said, the Dhamma, when we study Dhamma, Dhamma explains like this, because human mind is being burned by the, the, the three sets of fire, right? of lust, of hatred, of delusion. That's why we are not fully happy. 
whoever we are. You can born prince, you can born king, you still human being with crowded mind. And then the Buddha, the prince Siddhartha was not happy, so he went out searching, without knowing, searching for what? I just, I just cannot stay in the palace no more, so let me go. So he went out searching, and finally he found this place. He found this place. So, if you think of the world is very hot, dry, and unhappy, and all of a sudden he found something called air conditioning room. Oh, I found the place that cool, that when you enter into it, I feel happy, I feel calm, I feel peace, I feel so good about it. My suffering disappeared. He was so happy, I found air conditioning room. Air conditioning room. So he come out and he draw the map and he explain to people, hey guy, you know, I have been there. This is the map. You should go there. There is an air conditioning room. It's so hot here. You should go there and, you know, stay in the cool place over there. And that will make your life happier. And many people believe and follow the map and find the place. Many people believe, follow the map, but cannot find the place. There are many reasons why. Okay? So you all know that Bangkok exists and there are many ways to go to Bangkok. So I give you the map, some of you can make it through Bangkok. Some of you may not be able to make it through Bangkok. You may have accident, car accident, get bite by snake, get robbed by the thief. A lot of things can happen. You may change your mind, oh, I'm not going to Bangkok, I'm going to Nepal, I'm going to back, I'm going back to Singapore. Later on, you don't go to this place, you go to some place else. Okay, so there are many reasons why people don't achieve Nibbana, even though the path is exists, the explanation is exists, but still cannot go there, cannot realize it. Okay, okay, the last one. To me, this is the most important thing. We learn about you know deep stuff, the thing that we cannot experience. And what the benefit of learning this, if, even though we know for sure that this lifetime we cannot experience this. It's just a concept and what benefit for me of knowing this, Lumpi? Can I just not learn about it and being happy, being successful in life? And the answer is yes. You don't have to know about this, but you can be happy, right? So, the teaching of the Buddha is not just philosophical or theory for us, you know, to, to confuse us. Everything that he teaches, you know, will lead us to lessen our suffering, will lead, will lead us to free ourselves from suffering, will make our life happier. And that's the idea of learning the teaching of the Buddha. If you learn something deep, it only gives you confusion, it only gives you headache, and you don't know what to do with it. And why would you learn about it? So this slide, you know, I want you to think deeper how to apply the concept of Nibbana into practice. There are many people ask you know, this kind of question. When you teach the teaching of the Buddha to the kid at school, uh, to, to, to friends, and now you talk about Nibbana, which is so deep, and, and what benefit that people gain from you sharing this deep stuff with them? You need to find a way to answer this kind of question. Okay? So one of the uh, great Buddhist scholars in Thailand, Long Pao Buddhathasa, okay, he passed away a long time ago, Okay. Uh, he, his approach is quite interesting. Okay. Since Nibbana means cool, right? Peace that's from the, the word itself, that's what it means. So he said Nibbana can be realized on a day to day basis. We can experience Nibbana now, in this very moment. You don't have to wait until you oh, follow, completely follow the Eightfold Path and get rid of this thing and then get to the Nibbana, actual Nibbana. But Nibbana can be realized now. How? He said this, practice mindfulness. When you're mindful, your mind don't go anywhere. Your mind cannot be bothered by the, the cravings. You don't crave for, you don't crave to have, you don't crave to be, you don't crave not to be. You are having full control of your mind. 
and that's when you encounter peace in the peace when your mind is at peace and that is nibbana so i think this is very scientific people can relate to it if you teach the kids nibbana you teach them oh, okay if you meditate and your mind is at peace that is nibbana kid understand oh okay oh this is the feeling of nibbana experience peaceful cool the mind is at ease there's no worry in my mind and this and i think is simple explanation where people can relate it to okay so if you think of the fire the fire with the firewood there are many firewood that that cause the fire to burn bigger and bigger and create more heat that's what happened to all of us we are being burned because we put the fuel we put the firewood into ourselves more of this more of the tanha more of the craving we keep putting this thing into our life not just this lifetime every lifetime we have been we keep on doing this to burn ourselves with the fire of defilement so the idea of nibbana is, the idea of entering nibbana is for you to remove the piece of wood little by little if you have 10 if you remove five of them the heat will cool down you feel better you feel happier if you want 10 items in your life can you cut down to to three let go seven of them you see how relieved it will be you have one phone you want five phone can you cut down to one simple phone and use for a very long long time instead of focusing on having more phone that's that's the example so if you can find a way to remove okay the cause of suffering okay the the piece of firewood remove it little by little on your daily basis that will make you happier every day that you wake up not not do opposite and to me this is something that help us to get closer to nibbana we don't have to like sit eight hours try to enlightenment <laughs> which 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 we don't know when if you wait until you you achieve that you know you know maybe this lifetime is not possible but if you do that daily basis what caused you suffering what caused you unhappy what caused people around you not happy and then you fix that maybe your behavior maybe your laziness maybe you're not on time maybe you talk too much can you minimize that cause of conflict that will allow you to live on daily basis happier and to me that's most important of why we learn the dhamma to make ourselves happy and to help others happy okay so with that i'm done for today just perfect timing and rejoice in your marriage <laughs>